we're about 15 minutes in and and in a little bit i want to um break and i'm not going to actually stop recording but this will be the mark where we go for the parrot room in just about 10 minutes so let's go let's 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 look at the forest uh one more time before we mm-hmm. kind of veer into the con- contemporary moment a little bit more in the parrot room leads to this general discrediting of the left and so the left that you have like during when you when you are a teen and when i'm a kid is not is a fractured left that's only about issues because it can't conceive of any broader strength to do with well i mean okay so this brings me to the you know to our contemporary moment and which which we will extend in a way that uh, is like old geezers would do this um all mm-hmm. the way back to 1990 let's say The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. The the famous, the infamous (laughs) Derek Varn is back on Diet Soap. It's been a little while. I'm not sure how long it's been. I like your hair. Thank you. Looking good. Um, What has been going on, I guess, before... I, I should... For people who don't know, Derek Varn was a longtime co-host of Pop the Left with me, a uh, regular uh, guest on Diet Soap, worked at Zero Books as a reader, um, and uh, about, a, I, I would say, six months to a year ago, I finally got the knife out of my back, and <laughs> I'm glad to have him back uh, on uh, Diet Soap now. Um, Derek, you have your own youtube channel and podcast now and have you. have you had your own podcast a few times this is the the latest iteration of what you're calling the varn vlog is that is that right yeah it was varn vlog started out as a joke um i mean it actually started out because i was bored one month i took uh on hiatus uh back when i worked at zero and just started ranting into the screen about trends i saw on the left Mm-hmm. Uh, and I called it Varm Vlog just because the alliteration, and unfortunately, it stuck. Mm-hmm. Um, I have run out of creative titles for podcasts, uh, having blown them all already. Um, so um, that's where we're at. I, I, Varm Vlog has a couple of subsidiary uh, collaborated collaborative projects that go on with it. I do. Uh, Diving into the wreckage with Sean uh, uh, KB from Antifada. I do Parallax Vlog with JG Michaels, uh, Parallax Views. And um, it, I will be resuming No Royal Road with Regrettable Century. Um, so those are the sub projects there. Uh, but mostly it's it's trying to interview people who I think are are interesting on the left and trying to teach people how to think, which is a remarkably hard thing to do, particularly when you have no patience for your own audience. (laughs) Yeah. Well, um, well, teach me how to think then for a minute, like give me an example of the kinds of things that you would try to teach on Varn vlog. Well, so there's, we kind of go through different, different idea sets. Um, One thing I've been working on is explaining the development of terms that we use on the left, something actually we kind of did in the beginning of the second iteration of pop the left. Mm -hmm. So I went through the history and use of tailism, how it's changed, what it originally meant, why it's hard to follow what it means because each change in its historical development and our usage actually is related to the prior definition, Mm -hmm. but removes it from it. So originally it means tailing the most regressive ideas in the working class to try to win them over. Uh, when, like, when did it emerge? When, when did, in what context did that emerge? Uh, 
that was something Ingalls complained about. So socialists trying to pick up like whatever jingoistic or chauvinistic um, patterns that were local to whatever nation they were in uh, to try to win over the working class by appealing to what socialists kind of took as backwards or un, our unsocialist beliefs or beliefs that really just have nothing to do with communism whatsoever um, and using it to try to get the workers to you. Then it shifted around the time of Lukash and we did an episode on this ourselves um, to mean a kind of circular logic where whatever, where you justify whatever you do because the workers like it, because whatever the workers do is inherently right. Mm -hmm. um, that was what uh, Lukash was accused of. He wrote a whole book trying to defend himself against it. Um, mm -hmm. In the 1920s through 1950s, for example, Taylorism gets expanded to tailing parties that have elements of working class support to do entryism. So you get it kind of tied into certain other concepts. And this is where you start seeing, although this is not why this doesn't initially happen to America, critiques of various forms of the popular front being called tailless because they are tailing positions to the right of sometimes even like the workers parties in their country. Um, and through that usage, we get it into to what we mean today, which is tailing a party um, mm -hmm. more than tailing a class. Um, unfortunately, like, for example, I would say all major factions of socialists today are tailing somebody from the various definitions that we have. Another thing that we might cover over on Barn Vlog is a con like people who think they understand and debunked common concepts like the tragedy of the commons or the iron law of oligarchy are these other kinds of ideas that come up out of, out of uh, sometimes right wing, sometimes centrist liberal sociology and talking about what a socialist answer to it actually is, but also that a lot of people who to just th write them off don't actually know what they're talking about. Like, for example, the tragedy of the commons does exist under certain conditions. Um, there are ways around it. And frankly, the ways around it don't, they seem to have political implications, but they actually kind of don't because both libertarians and anarcho-socialists like the ways around it. So it, it doesn't actually have much content. Okay. Let's, let's, let's pause. I want to go back to tailism because that, that concept is one which, um, you know, seem to be significant in, in the last uh, half decade, let's say, uh, or more. Um, particularly um, uh, the idea of tailing the Democrats or uh, the the getting you know, this move to get involved with the DSA was accused was accused of being a kind of tailist move. I think mm -hmm. it was a kind of tailism, um, and I I wonder if the transformation you're talking about to the term reflects a transformation to what would be considered possible historically. Like at, at one point, Taylorism was tailing the workers because there was a strong political workers movement to mm -hmm. tail. And now it is tailing uh, some bourgeois party or another because there is no workers politics to, to follow the, would that be, Fair? Yeah, that's a great instinct, actually. One thing I would one thing I've been thinking about is not believing just the ideological or genius, even the ideological genealogical lineage to some of these things, but looking at the conditions which generated them. Mm -hmm. um, why is tailism such a problem? Is it just, you know, idiot leftists doing political bad faith moves? And I, I tend to think no, actually. And this is one of the things where. I'm sort of frustrated with a lot of the critiques of the left from the left these days, not because they're wrong, but because they don't actually try to answer the conditions problem. Like what made this more likely to happen? Why did say some better political option not manifest on the table? And you can say something like regression or you can say tailism or any number of things. And this is superficially true, but it's actually not that explanatory. Like, why is that happening? 
But let's um, let's take a specific example. Why did um, the Marxist left, let's say after, it's well after, but after the financial crisis and after Occupy, mm -hmm. um, fail to develop a political project, an independent political project and party to aim at transforming uh, uh, society itself and overcoming capitalism? Why well, did that that political option not ever manifest and why did we end up stuck with uh, Syriza, Sanders, Corbyn, so forth. Um, I think there's there's a couple of, of problems that we can we can kind yeah. of look at. One is we are in our understanding of both the political apparatuses available to us and in our most of our conceptual and analytic and analytic frameworks. So both um say linen party building structures um uh most economic analysis is actually methodologically nationalist which leads you stuck to dealing with national conceptions of party once you do that you have to deal with the legal frameworks of that nation and in mm -hmm. most of these nations it doesn't really leave you a lot of options that historically isn't what the the socialist movement did, except in Germany mm -hmm. uh, after during the Weimar period, because in most of the time period in which we were most active in the 19th century, we were not legal entities. So it's it's hard for people to wrap their mind around that when they say we, we you and I did a show about this, but we talked about the history of the concept of party, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, Marx, Marxist parties after Marx and Engels die, which is really when they start to coalesce, are not really of the same, like, historical development as voter-based parties in English-speaking countries, which start out of parliamentary coalitions and go into broad voter-based parties in the United States, etc. Those are actually different things. Like, they had completely different functions. Um, okay. So, so that's one limitation. What was the, what was the function of the party originally? Just remind me of that. The function of the party in the Marxist context, mm -hmm. the function of the party in the Marxist context was a form of organization that was trans union. So it develops out of the coalition of different workers and nationalist movements coming together, um, and to, to build some way to operate within a bourgeois nation state. And, and we have to remember in the early periods of Marxist development, the internationals were the preferred form. And in the first international parties were not the dominant groups that entered. It was all kinds of things. It was unions. It was political sex. It was, um, you know, parliamentary groups in different countries. It was nationalist revolutionaries in Italy and Germany. It was all kinds of things. Right. Um, so that that party that that is seeking uh, state power through a voting block um, is different than the party that's going to bring together a, a bunch of different trade unionists, uh, uh, trade unions, and and workers uh, organizations from across the globe. Right. And try to coordinate their actions in what. Uh, I'm going to assume they thought of as a revolutionary period. Like they, they were not, they were coordinating and, and orchestrating a struggle mm -hmm. by the workers rather than trying to um, set laws or, or policies or, or tell the police what to enforce or, right, or yeah. the military where to go. Wait, in, in so much of those parties participated in national parliamentary elections, the, the, uh, and I think the work of Mike McNair, who I don't always love, but I think on this he's correct, uh, they participated to actually block um, bourgeois attacks on the working class. And that's pretty much all they existed for. The, the initial um, formulation of the United Front was that you could vote on very specific issues to stop things from happening. And basically what socialist parties did until they could assume power was obstruct. And this changed uh, kind of off of Kowski 
realigning what the United Front was to try to become a more effective ruling party in Germany, but it led to the high period of the SPD managing austerity for the working class, being outflanked on monetary policy by fascists um, Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. This, this was kind of a disaster. And we talked about that history too. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting about now when the DSA is kind of a tailless agreement um, with the DSA, you have to deal with its own history and the history of the U S left. And this is something that I think has kind of been played around with in the last few years, people appealing uh, from, from the Tom Frank angle to like the popular party and the populist party, um, both are basically the same thing. Uh, Groups that had strong uh, electoral backing, but whose base was a mixture of workers and sharecroppers um, and whose political failure in, de- in early 20th century kind of descent into paranoia and then ir- irrelevance was largely based off of the end of sharecropping. So when people talk about trying to bring that back now, particularly the whole like left and right, a fight against the center kind of stuff that you hear with the appeal of, of left populism as an appeal of an American approach to this, it is decontextualized from the fact that the base of those parties actually fell apart and they were recuperated even before the socialist movement into the democratic party by the, um, by the career of William Jennings Bryant pulling them in to what would become the Wilson coalition, which ended up uh, pushing a lot of those people into the first socialist party of America. But then 1917 happens. The socialist party starts to split 1918 happens. um, And Debs is jailed uh, by Wilson and the SPA day goes, I mean, not the SPA day, the SPA goes into precipitous decline. All right. So when we talk about all this ancient history as far as socialists go. Um, we have to look at the fact that this stuff is often resurrected ad hoc to justify this or that thing. One of the things that we've seen in the DSA right now is a resurrection of Mike McNair's work to justify um, a kind of labor organizational strategy that is mostly about being labor staff, not rank and file members. Um, mm-hmm. uh, that is the orientation of the DSA's outreach into labor. Mm-hmm. Um, the DSA uh, particular that just sh- you know what you know, my opinion is my knee jerk mm-hmm. reaction to that move is that's just a bit of the way for the DSA to liquid liquidate itself into jobs for justice. But, um, <laughs> but well, I mean, it is recapitulating actually in many ways exactly what happened in the 1960s and 70s with the new left turn to the factory floor, except we're skipping the part where they first attempt to salt work sites by becoming workers. So all these right. students go and try to enter factories to re-radicalize them, to rebuild the workers' movement from within, based off of the now largely forgotten history of the T-U-E-L and the T-U-U-L, which are the kind of S-P-U-S-A um aligned although you didn't have to be a communist to be in them uh movements the sp uh excuse me the t-u-e-l was an attempt to do that within the existing unions the t-u-u-l was an attempt to do that um with independent unions they eventually join with john lewis's kind of republican but industrial union worker um cio um And that's kind of the height of the socialist union movement. Um, Unfortunately, that coincides with the shift in geopolitical strategy and the popular front, putting these unions directly tied into the Democratic Party, Mm -hmm. uh, which we must remember that before FDR is the party of segregation it's a party of the losing side of the civil war it's it's not really obvious at all other than what had already happened with william jennings bryant uh 
that this would be the logical party for for um, socialist and communist to enter in. And in fact, if you were going to predict something off of the 19th century, you would have predicted it was the Republicans. Right. Um, so what what happens here is like a habit we can't break. This happens again in the 60s. Right. We now this is where I think we're recapitulating things. We have these people try to enter from all these different sectarian movements that come out of the splintering of the SDS, which is kind of has a different history than the DSA, but is the only left wing force that I can think of that is similar in size and is eventually controlled by socialists and communists, although it doesn't start that way. Um, when the SDS falls apart. Uh, the CPUSA is largely seen as stuck in popular front mode. Um, and a lot of the organizing victories in the 50s actually happen around Trotskyist. What happens then is you have this major kind of shift out of the SPA and the, and the, and the SDS. Um, in the 70s, you have what we call the, you know, the, the, the entrance of the factories that doesn't go well. People then try to enter into professional activist organizations. They relocalize. They get called into um, the progressive movement of the Democratic Party. Um, mm -hmm. This explains like Oakland Mayor Jing Kwan, who was a militant Maoist in her early 20s and ends mm -hmm. up being a kind of neoliberal mayor of, of Oakland. It, it creates... Um, Lots of loss, unfortunately. Um, leftist history, you know, historians who look at this then can look at since a lot of these groups were also messed with by COINTELPRO, can blame COINTELPRO for that loss without dealing with the fact that these organizations were hemorrhaging members into NGOs and and union leadership, um, etc. And this is the exact time period where union leadership really starts to separate from rank and file leadership. It's kind of a, a couple of things happen. Closed shop, which I know most socialists are supposed to like, but I actually think kind of ended up making the unions non-responsive to their own workers happens. Um, you start seeing union. Leader... Remind me what closed shop is. is supposed closed to shop is it, it, since the union negotiates a contract for everybody, everybody must be in the union, which sounds great, except mm -hmm. that um, if union leadership is not responsive to voting, um, then, then they can be responsive to the members dropping out. Right. And then that makes that irrelevant. So there's literally no way to hold union leadership accountable. Uh, right. um, particularly when you start having the separation of the professional organizers within the union mm -hmm. and the elected leadership. And this is true for almost every union where there's elected leadership and there's professional like the organizers. State. There's, a, there's the permanent bureaucracy and mm -hmm. the elected officials. Exactly. And this falls a lot. That I mentioned the iron law of oligarchy earlier, where this is where this matters. Um, this is a predicted trend that um, Michelle Robert and Alfredo Pareto pointed out uh, and why they gave up being socialist and became fascist um, mm -hmm. was was this idea that if you weren't that you always built these bureaucratic institutions that would supplement whatever thing, form a core of leadership that would actually lead to inertia and burnout. So even democratic checks don't really work against them. And they kind of run the institution for themselves and then into the ground. Mm. Um, in the 1970s and uh, the late Michael Brooks and I once talked about this. Um, it was uh, oddly the Atari Democrats who realized that union leadership was getting paid so, so much from stuff like stock dividends like the union leadership was getting paid by stock dividends, not by rank and file uh, membership bases that they were going to lose popularity with the rank and file. And so these kind of neoliberal, but less neoliberal than the Republican Democrats could kind of swoop in and move in on other issues because the traditional labor base for the Democratic Party had actually shot itself in the foot. Most people read what happened with the Atari Democrats as being caused by, by the political actors, right? And this, mm -hmm. this is a constant problem on the left. Mm 
they don't look at how the political actors saw trends that were already happening and took advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and they wrote about it explicitly. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we have, okay, let me, let let me, let me just pause you here. Okay. A couple of thoughts. Um, because I want to, because we've covered a whole lot of history in a little bit of time and it's been very, uh, interesting to do so, but okay. You just said the political actors were responding to and taking advantage of, trends that were happening at the time and then so the, and to define what those trends are in this case they're the political decisions of another sector not actually what we think of as a political sector meaning the politicians but the uh, elected and unelected leadership of the unions um which are which are themselves responding to changing conditions within the working class well, they're responding right. to a couple of things. They're responding right. to deindustrialization beginning at the end of Fordism in the 1960s yeah. and 70s. They're responding to the way that that has moved from rank and file militancy into kind of different levels of of middle management that they have to deal with. Um, that can really gum up their own negotiation work. So they actually start trying to take less hostile stances towards them. And theoretically, these middle managementers are are workers. And sometimes they side with the workers. So this is not like, it's not a clear that they always side with capital. So, so deindustrialization, the move away from factory work, mm-hmm. uh, assembly work, um, even maybe piece work and towards um, office work and uh, the, prof- the professionalization of, of work. Right. Uh, the, and the credentialization of work. Right. That all of that created the conditions for the uh the union leaders to change uh their approach from one where they were reliant on the votes of the workers and the membership dues from the workers now to one where they had a closed shop. I'm just trying to this may be completely wrong. So, so close shop, shop predates, predates this, but yeah, right. but but once you get that, you start seeing this shift to different kinds of unionization. All right. Mm. Um. So let just let me just finish if I can. And they the their mode of pay changes, so they're no longer paid by the dues; they're paid through mm-hmm. stocks. Um. In essence. The union is sort of incorporated into the corporation. That it's a, another division of the the corporation is not independent in, in some ways because uh, one thing you're i'm assuming you're being paid in the stock in stock in the company but maybe you're not but if you're no, it could be paid in stocks in all kinds of companies so what what okay. this means is you start seeing like uh another thing that we have to get into explain this is actually a bunch of political decisions made during the the great social compact period, because while everyone talks about the 1910s um, as, you know, are the 1930s as their period of like, that's where we need to go back to for organization. The picture of America they tend to promote is when we were the closest we ever were to social democracy in quotes. And, you know, we can get into what social democratic countries were doing because they were paralleling us in many ways. Um, but the way that's handled in the U.S. is during this social compact, labor is treated as part of the negotiations between the state and and ownership and management, and labor is seen as having a deal at the table, right? And so later, leadership yeah. is seen as having a deal. deal now, the table have. meaning the the uh, the table of a, the, of inside a corporation, but also within the state. Yeah, also, I mean, like, because you're looking at these things as kind of, these are ready-made voter blocks for the Democratic Party, and certain industries are even voter blocks for the Republican Party. Um, It, so you have this kind of social compact, and Adolf Reed talks about this, it has three legs. Um, This actually is not a great thing for socialists, because what this does is it instantiates the the union leadership, particularly, and remember this is happening towards the fifties and in 1956, all the communists are purged when the AFL CIO merge. So now you have a D a red scare cleansed. So, uh, union leadership that doesn't have, 
any of the remnants of these communist organizers, a lot of these communist organizers, regardless of their ideology, were the best organizers that these groups had. But during the social compact period, that wasn't seen as important, right? They had a seat at the table. They could put pressure on both parties and get stuff passed to some degree. Um, there are exceptions. The exceptions, unfortunately, have ended up being the majority of contemporary unionism. And this is another part not dealt with by the DSA, but we can get back to that. Mm. Um, and the exceptions were like civil circle and municipal unions and um, uh, essential services that were not included in the National Labor Relations Act. Mm. All right. Um, the other thing that happens, and we talked about this before, if Taft-Hartley is strategically designed to make sure that in the United States, um, no union can formally promote dual cardism or cross industry strikes or political striking, meaning that the traditional means that were used to form labor parties mm -hmm. cannot happen here. Mm -hmm. In addition, starting in the 1950s, we see state laws really codifying um, prohibitions against third party rule, formalizing these two private corporations, which are not formally part of the government structure, into state level government um, organizations that are semi private but are recognized by state law and give pre get preferential treatment in most, although not all, states. Now we're building up to what the problem becomes. Um, so this led us through. The Gen X, this gets us to the Gen X left, because the Gen X left comes in at the moment when there's a, re well, let me reach for, I need to go back a little bit. While this is happening in private sector unions and public sector unions, you see this burst of radicalization, particularly against Nixon, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's when you started having the wildcat. Pull what was it about Nixon that inspired within the labor movement a radicalization? Or was it? Price controls also included wage controls. Wages okay. are a price, <laughs> like mm -hmm. particularly in the federal government. Um, so, so Nixon's kind of making sure that ma suppressing federal wages, um, particularly in like low skilled sectors like the post office. Mm -hmm. um, and this leads to a wave of wildcat strikes. They're illegal, but they're so problematic for the government that the government kind of concedes to them. However, Republicans at this point make a pact never to let that happen again. And when they see Margaret Thatcher break that in Europe, you got this leads up to the wildcat a wildcat strike amongst aircraft traffic control workers who are unionized, but since they're not part of the NCLA, they're not technically allowed to strike. Uh, Reagan is able to to use that to crush them and this is kind of built off of the beginning of souring of relations in the 1970s meanwhile as we've talked about private labor has become i mean private unionization has become unpopular in the 70s right for reasons that we're we're getting to union leadership is seen as paid separately it's seen as corrupt um in places where the kind of implication into the corporate and professional world is impossible uh, there's even some some uh, government attempts to accelerate this, but you see increasing involvement in um, accelerate what? Accelerate the corruption? Accelerate? No, no. Excel. Well, actually, it's a different kind of corruption. This is when we start seeing like the Jimmy Hoffa period of like former Trotskyist unions getting involved in the mob. All right. Yeah, that's what I thought you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the is, government is encouraging in many because ways, there's because there's no way for the leadership of the unions to enter into the professional classes. Right. They are the union leadership looks for other ways to use their the power of their their political power they have within the union to get deals and and uh, work out a nice life for, their for workers. themselves. Yep. And, and for and for themselves. Yeah. Right? Of I mean, course. Yes. Right. Right. I mean, if you're if you're looking at professionalizing um, and breaking off from the rank and file to enter the sector of the, you know, go to the same parties as the, the bosses in one area. And that isn't open to you. So you go to the same 
parties as the crim the the head criminals instead. Mm -hmm. um, that's not necessarily neither looks to me like it's really in the interest of the workers. Um, you know, I guess it can be, but um, uh, it seems like you've got some corruption going on in both. So what you had was a lot of spreading of graft, and like so, the graft wasn't just spread personally. I actually think one of the this is a portrayal that's really portraying it way too late. But if you go back and watch the second season of The Wire, uh, mm -hmm. the, the the way they portray that as happening in the '80s, and particularly in areas of logistics where where smuggling is a big deal, mm -hmm. um, this is this is kind of how it operated. Yes, there was a lot of personal graft involved, but there was also probably there was a lot of fair amount of like, well, we're getting additional work for these people. We're getting them back to additional pay. We're spreading this graft around. Um, yeah. Have you, have you seen the TV show shameless? Yes. Yeah. Um, in shameless, you know, there's one particular scene. I remember where a meat truck gets stalled and the driver asks these kids where the closest phone booth is. And they send them way off on a wild goose chase. And then they alert everyone in the neighborhood uh, to come and they just ransack the meat truck. They don't just grab all the meat for themselves. They share it for mm -hmm. their little network of mutual support in the, in the neighborhood. So it's, it's corrupt. It's thieving, you know, it's thievery, but it's also, there's some, you, you root for them as they steal all the meat out of this guy's truck. Right. Because this is feel good family community kind of action. Right. So. And of course in the eighties, the media picks up on this and makes a huge deal out of it. These are the sectors that also are completely decimated by economic development in the 1980s and the regions that it really gets hit. Mm. So what happens also before people leave because of corruption or whatever is they're just not working in industrial work anymore. And we are seeing with like the Starbucks unions as, as much as it's important that they're happening, um, that each one of those sites, even though that's not a franchise, so this is this is technically easier, but each one of those sites is its own negotiation site for its own contract, right? It doesn't take each, you long. each store. It's not like a, a it's or not each a region, of... but it could be one store. It depends on the, the the regional management. That's why this has to happen. That's why it can't happen with Starbucks nationally all at once. It's happening area to area, city to city, sometimes store to store. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, that's partly set up by the way we do labor law in America, um, but because we don't do sectional unionizing. Now, what I want to note something that in the course of this conversation, we've shifted mm -hmm. from the 19th century, where we're talking about a, pol a political a, a party, a revolutionary party to organize all these uh, different kinds of working class organizations um, now down to a very particular kind of trade unionism mm -hmm. with very limited goals and the reasons why they can't achieve those, those goals have right difficulty. Yeah. So, so when I explain this, it is, it is easy to get lost in the forest. And, and, the and it kind of like, it's, it, it's easy to, to start to just accept the very constrained vision of labor politics that we have today and focus on all the ways in which that's thwarted. Right. right. Um, and it is thwarted, but the one thing that I think is in the background that's sort of um, that's being implied and they may be true is that the, the way in which labor is thwarted um, also limits the political horizons for labor. Correct. Okay. And, and, and the political horizons and labor thwarting is not just unlike what people like David Harvey tell you from the political will of bad faith actors in the government. Yes, that political will exist. Yes, those bad faith actors do exist. Yes, for example, neoliberalism is partly a political project, oh, but it was a political project inspired by specific conditions which we had not figured a way around. And the reason why I say this is important is there's two trends on the left that in Cerezo, to go back to an example that we were talking yeah. about in Europe. <clears throat> there was right? a tendency, yeah. Yeah. There's a tendency with Teresa to believe that Greece could, by having currency independency, become materially independent beyond its geography. 
Um, yeah, I mean that was not not that was not really believed until like after the fact, or maybe <laughs> no, maybe it was, we were debating Farrah with has, people. Farrah Fock has thought about that, but that belief lost. I mean that that belief did not win the day. No, but that was but that was the promise in which the whole referendum was given. All right. Well, no, but the referendum wasn't about shall we break off from the euro and make our own currency. That was not what the referendum was about. It was that shall we accept the conditions given. Right. But yeah. your options of accepting the conditions given were. <laughs> like, well, I mean, I think maybe some people just thought, well, we'll tell them no and they'll renegotiate. Right. Rather but than. What's your leverage if you're not leaving? Well. I mean, don't you I, don't want to hurt us? You know, we're part of your your, your union. You don't want to hurt the people of Greece, do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, sympathy, right. I guess. <laughs> um, and but this kind of this, the, you actually see both tendencies that we're talking about here, a uh, kind of ignoring of the history of the constraining of labor. Mm. Now, I can go into. I don't want to, and like, because this can take hours. But similar things actually happened. In, in, you know, the wonderland of Nordic Europe that the DSA tells me exists, which is why you started seeing both nationalist and neoliberal policies started becoming more and more popular in the voting bloc in the late 70s. And that was also because, for example, in Sweden, the, the sectional labor organization was seen as helping the state maintain inflation by wage suppression. Uh, so fight against inflation by wage suppression was incredibly unpopular. In Italy, this led to the creation of um, autonomy and operismo because the sectional negotiations, which were done over whole sectors with the whole country, just left so many people out that it was seen as creating a different kind of union bureaucracy. You didn't give a shit about the conditions of the workers of Italy. And so you actually had kind of splinter movements within the official communist movement that became nearly ultra leftist, even though they came out of a Stalinist movement um, to get sectional concessions for their workers for specific things instead of just this national contract because the needs were different. And so you see similar, although very different problems develop all over the world. Right. Mm. Um, so it's one of these things when we tell the history of, say, neoliberalism, we always tell it primarily from the standpoint of the Anglo world. And then, oh, yeah, it's like forced austerity on Latin America, who's trying to do its protectionism. And there's some truth to that, that neoliberal trade arbitration is about not letting developing countries actually do the same kind of capitalist protection rackets that the, cap the major capitalist cores did in their own development. Mm. But... It's also missing the fact that some of the same problems that we saw had concurrent but slightly different developments elsewhere, and that led to different political problems. So in a place like Greece, which has always been kind of the periphery of Europe um, since the end of the Ottomans, really, um, what you see there is kind of people, there's kind of a, well, they're going to be nice to us because, I mean, not all the Europeans can hate our guts. And I'm like, well, they don't hate you. They, it's just this is an economic decision. People get awfully. No, I know. It was ridiculous. It. it was ridiculous, right? I mean, that the, 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 the fact that Syriza turned around and, and said, not only will we take your original offer, but here we'll, we'll make it even worse for us, you know, um, mm. uh, was a little surprising. But the fact that the referendum had no effect you know, wasn't surprising, but, but, um, all right. So I, I don't want to get lost in the trees. Um, I do feel like all the trees are important. Like you can't understand the forest mm -hmm. without knowing all the trees, but, or as many of them as, as possible, or at least all the types that there are in the forest. So to summarize this real fast for the forest view, what we have mm -hmm. is the change of work limiting the way formal workers development came out in the 20th century in various parts of the developed world in a way which made it seem like these concessions were impossible even before the Soviet Union was gone. And we must remember at this point, the Soviet Union is no longer seen as a threat that can export itself to the rest of the world like it did in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s when people really cared about this. So this is part 
of what's happening, particularly after the Sino-Soviet split and the communist world is literally sometimes literally at war with itself. Um, I want to return to something you said really early, though. You t- were talking about the 19th century in which and again about how the organizing of the party wasn't about these parliamentary parties, but was about um, organizing a variety of different workers groups and internationally. And what occurred to me, you know, from my limited historical understanding was that during that era, um, the struggle, especially say around 1848 and then after was not for uh, uh, workers rights within bourgeois nations but was uh, for the development of both the bourgeoisie and the proletariat against an er- uh, um, uh, the aristocracy. against Correct. The, right, and against what was not a r- truly national power center. It was an international empire. There were international empires at work. There were kingdoms that w- just didn't operate uh, in, on a national basis in the same way that, Correct. that our, our states do today. So, so the struggle was different. Right. Well, th- we have to remember that we pull most of our struggle, understanding of struggle, even in parts of the world that aren't aren't European, which I'm, I'm always going to hear people complain about, well, this is Eurocentric. Well, I'm like, I can't help where the history happens. Right. Right. Um, but like the consolidation of the nation state had really only happened in England and France before 1848 as kind of an accident and then a deliberate project of a, of a few particularly... Uh, kings at the end of you know what, what we might call the early modern period um that that's really about making mercantile nations this also happens with with spain but spain kind of overextends itself and and puts every all their development into both church based stuff and the military in ways that like don't lead it to the same kind of advantages that france and england have um mm-hmm. so and it, I, like why I think that's super important. If I go into those trees, we're going to be there for years. Um, so, yeah. But the reason I bring that up is that when we think about an international party today, um, we should at least remind ourselves that our that the that the struggle for socialism and the struggle for uh, this is almost just a slogan. Okay. So just, we have to unpack it to see if there's anything to it, but the struggle for socialism and the struggle for the bourgeois nation arrived at the same time. And uh, that, that we, we have to conceive of our project as being um, uh, the reformation of the world as that is as significant and totalizing as a change from the aristocracies and empires and, and kingdoms uh, of the 18th, 17th, 16th centuries and before into what we think of as modernity and Correct. the nation states. So that, 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 I mean, so and then fact, when we, it puts us ahead. in the weird and unenvious position of socialists being one of the primary pushers of nation states to create to modernize um like semi like semi feudal uh prior imperial pre modern like peoples um mm. into modern production um and it kind of becomes something that Plakhanov was really worried about which was a particularly uh, for, and I'll say who that is for your listeners. So Pekan, Gordon Pranov is kind of the founder of the Russian social democratic movement slash the Bolsheviks. He's uh, he's the person who kind of rejects the idea that the peasant communes can kind of piggyback on capitalism, but not go through it, mm. um, which is played with by Marx in a bunch of letters. But Marx doesn't ultimately go there. Pekanov is afraid that if they have the revolution too early in these areas that um, they will have to do such brutal capital development regimes. He calls it, um, he he likens it to the empires of Peru. And sometimes you hear this referred to as Incan development. Um, mm-hmm. If you go looking for the actual term Incan development, you're not going to find it in, uh, in Plakhanov, but that's what he's talking about. And what he means by that is you're going to have these, 
these kind of like socialistic but highly exploitative um, systems that have to have to produce modern economies so fast that they're going to do so at the expense of thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives. That's what he's afraid of in like the 1890s, 1900s. Um, he ends up being right. I mean, there, there are critiques of his position. Um, you know, the anarchists and a lot of even some left comms critique him for uh, not trying to like use capitalist productions off of the the peasants communes as a, as a thing because marx did talk about that as a as a possibility but he went back and forth on it in letters to ingles and letters to virzo like whatnot um so why when we look at this we see this 19th century epoch change right in the 20th century we try to replicate it and i think that gets us into the confusion of national liberation as the socialist revolutions, even though only in like three cases, does it actually produce anything we can sort of kind of call so socialism by the Soviet standards, much less by any prior standards. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, but that ends up being a way in which Soviet and Chinese foreign policy really has an advantage. Now, again, I'm going to dip out, and talk about some different things here that you again, uh, and I'm going to try to do it quickly so we don't lose the, uh, the okay. Forces. Let's we're about 50 minutes in, and and in a little bit, I want to um break. And I'm not going to actually stop recording, but this will be the mark where we go for the parrot room in just about 10 minutes. So let's go, let's 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 look at the forest uh one more time before we mm -hmm. kind of veer into the con contemporary moment a little bit more in the parrot room. So go ahead. Okay, so the forest that sets up, I think, all the things at least to the current cul-de-sac of the la of what we can call the millennial left, to borrow a term from from uh, Platypus. Yeah, um, but what we see in the 20th century is is towards the 1950s, national liberation is the way that socialists see as their only means towards internationalism outside of the warsaw pact within the warsaw pact national so, uh national autonomy becomes a constantly contentious grounds because it's granted by lenin kind of kind of on principle grounds but also kind of on like we don't want to all these other peoples to immediately form nationalist rebellions against us so we're going to give them autonomy but to maintain the Warsaw Pact and the larger Soviet Union, the definition of that constantly changes. Favor groups constantly change. You have periods of Russification and de-Russification even before Stalin's death. Um, I, I used to think it was like Stalin flipped and had a Russification period. But when I actually started looking into the history there, you see that he just goes back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes like multiple times in the same year and people and like, people within the Soviet Union are like reading speeches for hints on where he's going to go um, at the end of World War II. Um, so this stuff around nation building seems to be where they think they can be successful since, since also going back to the forest and this is, this is the big forest, the, the revolutions in the core, neither in Germany or France happened um, and in fact, they resulted in a fascist movement, which threw everybody off. No one knew what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, it leads to this kind of, well, okay, we didn't have success with the way that we were supposed to have it. If we do this national development, we can, can keep, we can build international goodwill and maybe eventually through national developmentalism, we can, um, incorporate these into the communist world etc a couple things happen one a lot of like african and middle eastern leaders get smart that they can get maximum resources by playing the soviets and the west off each other in competition constantly nasser is like a genius at this mm. um but this leads to the national liberation movements b being kind of gentlemen's agreements um and not really instilling a lot of loyalty to the soviets all right. Mm -hmm. um, while there are communist parties established in these areas, a lot of the nationalist movements that are empowered by the Soviet Union are immediate. The people putting these communist movements down. Um, mm -hmm. So you have that trend. 
um, Sino-Soviet split happens. That totally breaks that up. We also see that the miracle development of this early period of industrialization of the Soviet Union stops. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, you will see socialists and Marxist Leninists like cherry pick the stats from the 30s, even though they'll ignore stuff like while they had triple the productive capacity of, of the United States and they weren't seeing a decline in GDP growth. Um, I don't know why we have GDP growth in a communist country, but whatever. Uh, we <laughs> they're also ignoring that, like the average calorie consumed was like thirteen hundred a day. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Even all that said, that stops, all right? The Soviet Union, uh, for a variety of reasons, mostly paranoia, but um, starts putting all its developmental chips mainly in the military once the the heavy industries are developed. Um, They don't, that still affects us today. That's part of what's going on in Russia now, all right? They don't Mm -hmm. ever develop a large-scale consumer economy except in some luxury goods, which they export to the to the West to get international trade dollars and start their triple ruble system. And I'm not going to go into that. That's real. That's real treaty. So you have all these developments conversely in the West at the same time, the union movement's failing. The third party movement goes nowhere because these state laws and particularly these highly federated countries are able to recapture all this legal ground. So these, so even though there's massive frustration with the two parties and their traditional voting blocks are falling apart, Mm-hmm. Um, there is no, there's no means for them to develop like a, a party, even in the kind of way that they, they mean in America to recapitulate the populist party or the reform party or the green party or whatever, all these movements, which grow out of the collapse of the sectarian movement, I mean, the green party is literally a mixture of environmentalist and former communists coming together to try to do what they couldn't achieve in any of the things they achieved, tried to do in the late 60s and 70s after the SDS disbands. Mm. And this is really, and we lived through this part. Um, what really happens in the 90s, with, and this happens to coincide kind of accidentally with the fall of the Soviet Union, Mm -hmm. Uh, The nail in the coffin is put in the ground of these third parties because the states see a a reform party movement actually comes from the right mess up George Bush senior's um, presidency and Mm -hmm. they nail that shit down. All right. They make sure that you are in a two party voter bind at the state level as much as possible because constitutionally the states decide all this shit. And then what you see it's this kind of idea being circulated about two party runs that kind of go back to the early to the 19th century. Well, if we do two parties, we can't win, but maybe just maybe we can change the party. We can have our agenda change the party and this corresponding with the collapse of the Soviet union and the Soviet union's cul-de-sac and national developmentalism Um, which makes it popular in the third world, but also never delivers anything like communism at all, or even social democracy Mm. um, leads to this general discrediting of the left. And so the left that you have like during when you, you, when you are a teen and when I'm a kid is not, is a fractured left. That's only about issues because it can't conceive of any broader strength to do with. Well, I mean, okay. So this brings me to the, you know, to our contemporary moment and which, which we will extend in a way that uh, is like old geezers would do this um, all mm-hmm. the way back to 1990. Let's say. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.